Thanks, Jeff, for keeping it going. Thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, just real quick about the, the background that uh, Ashley didn't mention in that video. How the reading series started 10 years ago was Ashley David worked at Stanford in alumni relations, and she took a lot of courses in the continuing studies program, uh, which were all taught by former Stegner Fellows. So she started the program as a way to feature the work of her former teachers. Um, and so usually, back in the uh, 10 years ago, the way the readings would go, there'd be one Stegner Fellow in fiction, one in poetry, and then four or five readers from the local community. And that's kind of evolved over time, and, uh, and now we just have a variety of folks. So thanks everyone for coming out. Thanks, Jeff, for keeping it going. Um, I'm going to read some poems tonight from a manuscript called In Which White Horses Appear, which is a manuscript of poems all about San Francisco. Uh, its first poem is called Into the City. Off the train, up to market, I discover a separate city of quarter films and hustlers, veterans who wear the clothes they're given, mothers who awake to find the safety pins missing, pierced into the lips of three-chord punks who can't tune. On the street, dogs flash teeth like jewelry. History's written in brick and fracture, vestiges all around, sculpted colonnades, statues of soldiers, streets minted with the names of robber barons, dome rusted to the color of the dollar. Once the city shook and burned, now it seems the citizens find themselves in ruins, pink facade of the hospital through mist, the sick with views of the ocean and bridge. This next poem is called Burial Fragments. Um, as many of you probably know, there are no cemeteries in San Francisco, or I should say there are no longer any cemeteries in San Francisco. They were torn up in the 1930s and the 1940s uh, to make way for houses. And this poem is about what happened to some of those headstones. Some of them, some of them ended up in Golden Gate Park, and they're still, not Golden Gate Park, excuse me, uh, Buena Vista Park, and they're still there today. Burial fragments. There's no room for the dead in this small city, nearly an island, where we trade corpses for houses, digging up graves and exhuming the bones. You can die in San Francisco, but you can't keep the real estate. On a path toward the hospital, gutters were laid from headstones, names split from dates, the dead at rest in pieces. I visit to read fragments, cursive of another century spelling out a memory. Francis, loving mother. Many names I'll never find. They were turned to face the earth. I remember poems in the manuscript about bars. We seem to go to a lot of bars in San Francisco. It's true. If you ever have friends visit from out of town after a week, they'll say, like, people really go to a lot of bars here. I don't know. It's just what we do. So uh, the, the title of this poem will probably announce itself and make it already familiar to those of you who have been there. This is the Persian Op Zamzam Club, which is in the Upper Haight. And for years it was run by this guy named Bruno for many years. Uh, and there were rules if you were going to get served. So this is a poem about, uh, about Bruno and about the car. The Persian Op Zamzam Club. There are rules I won't follow. Take a seat, bills on the bar, order a dry martini. Bruno might serve pumps and spikes while suits get shown the door. Ladies receive napkins. He says the city's gone to hell. Women used to wear white gloves. Rubbing dust off a bottle. You can have a Budweiser eclipse. It's the worst beer brewed in America. <laughs> the glasses are polished like soldiers. Gleam like the eye of an earnest young man. What Bruno wants now is for you to follow orders. He fought overseas, served his country. What have you done? He still blames our troubles on the Japanese. This one takes place right down the street in the hate at the Gold Cane. This is the shape of conversation at the Gold Cane. Daniel's heroin mouth agrees with my politics. His father's money buys the beer. Daniel hasn't taken any job, he says, in years because they don't meet his criteria. As the night progresses, dropping change on tips and paps, we avoid cue sticks and come to an agreement. The future's not written to make the roses bloom. Who needs a country when you can have an island? 
I remember the unrevised Reagan, Fawn Hall, and Contras when the rich knew their place and didn't slum. What happened to the silver promises of childhood, the future we assume belonged to everyone? We'll stay here all night until the doors close, until the sun rises and the streets guide us towards sleep, if that's what it takes to solve the mystery. About this next one, I'll just say a true story. This is from the first summer I lived in San Francisco when I was moved here about 20 years ago. This is called Target Practice. A Sunday morning voice behind the door I hadn't opened said she was selling the Socialist Review and asked if I wasn't ready to take up arms for the revolution. I offered a dollar and the conversation turned to capitalism. She worked part time didn't vote, and spent her afternoons on the firing range, taking practice shots at President Clinton. I'd never held a handgun, and she wanted me to learn. The workers were uniting, but I wanted coffee and the paper, no matter what my comrades said. I don't believe in revolution, but I often want to let the stranger in. I'll read two more. Uh, all the drinking leads to babies. It's a known fact. Scientists have studied it. Uh, and so when our son was born three and a half years ago, he had a birthmark on his right cheek. Right cheek is important in the, uh, in the terms of the poem. And when I saw it, I just instantly knew there was going to be a lot of weird folklore and superstition around birthmarks. And so I did some research, and sure enough, there is. And this poem just collects some of that, that folklore. Birthmark. The mark that means the mother wished for wine spilled across his cheek like the boot of Italy. The spot that says she tasted beets, smashed apple, stork nip, angel spit. The stain there to remind us were made of blood, scar of a prior life, blemish to shine, flash, burn. Did she crave strawberries, startle and touch her face? Did she stare at mice? A finger pressed to her temple when the moon passed before the sun. Demon sign, sign of fortune. On the right cheek, a happy marriage. On the left, ruin. This last poem is the title poem of the manuscript in which white horses appear. And I'll dedicate this tonight to Jose, who's in the audience. Jose and I actually met on the end Judah, where this poem takes place years ago in which white horses appear. Through the tunnel on the line that ends at the beach, ends in fog, the car never empty, students and secretaries, an elderly Chinese woman hauling greens, no seat so you'd stand, quiet even there in the bodily rush. Streets tripped by and you picked up the alphabet, Quintara, Rivera, the ocean before you shimmered into place. Those were the first days, and this seemed like the new world, promised all along. The city so close to its psychedelic blaze, you caught a contact high. No one tipped you off, as two white horses appeared beyond the window, their own hallucination. Coats of cream, coats of fog, there as long as you were, and gone now, long gone. 